Hello everyone, my name is Greg Phelps and I'm the president of Red Rock Wealth Management here in very hot Las Vegas, Nevada. Very hot, especially in the month of August. Um, I am also the host of the RetireWire webinar series and blog and podcast. And today I have a, a subject that's very interesting um, to a lot of people, especially those of you looking for financial advice. It's interesting and near and dear to my heart because I am a financial advisor uh, and have been for over two decades, actually I believe now about 24 years or so. And a lot of you might come to this presentation, this webinar thinking, well, Greg's just gonna tell me, oh, hire me, hire me. And that's actually definitely not the case. Um, what I wanna share with you today is some proven, things, some tips, some tactics, some strategies that you can use to find a financial advisor wherever you are. Uh, because as you know, RetireWire is a national webinar series, blog series, podcast series. And so no matter where you are, you can be on the other side of the country. And I want to share with you, how are you going to find the right financial advisor that you can trust that might be right down the street from you? Uh, and, and additionally, there might be other financial advisors that have a very specific niche that you need that might not be right down the street. And so you might work with them virtually or online, just like we're doing here today on this webinar series. Uh, and also, I will be turning this webinar into a podcast that'll be loaded here within the next few days. So I'm going to go ahead and dig right into how to find a financial advisor that you can trust. So a few of the of the really important concepts I'm going to get right into up front. And what I want to touch on most importantly is the very first thing you need to focus on if you're not already aware of this is you need to find a fiduciary financial advisor. Now, what I mean by that is a fiduciary is a person, an individual that has the highest position of trust and confidence that they owe to another individual. Uh, they must put your interests above their own at all times, regardless of their income, regardless of the outcomes, uh, personally, professionally, they must put your interests above their own. So some examples of a fiduciary. Uh, accountants are a fiduciary. Doctors are a fiduciary. They have a fiduciary responsibility to you. Lawyers have a fiduciary responsibility to you. Now, surprisingly to most of you, a financial advisor, uh, an investment professional, a, a wealth advisor, whatever you want to call different financial planners or professionals in the industry, they do not all owe you a fiduciary responsibility. So it's shocking, I know, because you would think that the person who you entrust your, your entire life's finances and your investment portfolio to, they should have a fiduciary responsibility to you, and it's just not the case. Now, maybe you've heard in the news about the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. And a lot of you might think, well, it's passed, and, and actually it was passed, and now it's not. Um, but you might think, well, every financial advisor has a fiduciary responsibility, and it's just not the case. Uh, in fact, if you follow Tony Robbins' uh, materials at all, he's a very, very big proponent of finding a fiduciary financial advisor. And according to his statistics, not mine, I actually think the number's a little bit lower than he does. But according to his statistics, in Money Master the Game, his book, only about 10% of financial advisors are actually truly a fiduciary and they have that fiduciary responsibility to you. So why is this so important? It's so important because when you're going to open up the book, so to speak, when you're going to show another individual who is a quote unquote professional, who is there to guide you with your investments and your insurance and your retirement plan and so forth, when you're going to show them all of your finances it's really critical to know that you can trust that person, that you have confidence that they can, they can provide what they need to provide for you. And that most importantly, from the fiduciary perspective, that they're going to put your interest, your end results, your goals, your finances above their own. And there are many examples of conflicts of interest uh, that exist in this industry today. For example, if XYZ advisor, uh, if you need an insurance policy or an investment policy, they might find a way to put the investment policy or the investment plan into the insurance policy because they get a bigger commission. Whereas the investments could be just fine in a regular trust account at a regular brokerage firm and not in an insurance policy, but that might not pay them the biggest commission. And so that's an example of a conflict of interest. Here's another example of a conflict of interest. Uh, if you've got an investment portfolio with your advisor and that portfolio is a half million dollars and you've got a mortgage on your house and you're retired and that mortgage is, let's just say 5% you're paying on that. Well, the conflict of interest is if I tell you to take that $100,000 out of your investment portfolio and pay that mortgage off, number one, it might be the best thing for you. 
But number two, it's probably not the best thing for that financial advisor because now they're managing less assets. They have less opportunity to, to charge fees and to get commissions on those assets. And so that's another conflict of interest. So it's very, very critical, this fiduciary concept that you understand it, that you embrace it, and that you realize that number one, first and foremost, your advisor must be a fiduciary. Now, I've been hearing some interesting things lately from people who come into the office. They're saying, oh, my uh, ex, I'm not gonna use specific companies because that'll probably get me in some hot water. But my XYZ broker down the street, they told me that they're a fiduciary, that everybody's a fiduciary. Um, and, and it's just not true. And it's not true on a lot of different levels, but not everybody is a fiduciary. Again, according to Tony Robbins and his book and his research, about 10% of all financial advisors are actually true fiduciary professionals that owe you the utmost in terms of making sure that your goals are, are reached, that your problems are solved with complete disregard to their own income and their own outcomes. So it's a very, very important concept. Now, compare and contrast that with, as I mentioned, the, the investment professional or investment advisor or financial advisor at XYZ brokerage firm down the street. Most people in this industry that call themselves a financial advisor in whatever form that they may be, they are held not to a fiduciary standard because that standard across the country does not exist. There is a, an interesting little twist that Nevada put into law, um, but it's very watered down and, and nobody knows exactly how far reaching it's going to be as far as a fiduciary standard for advisors in Nevada. Uh, but, but those advisors that are at certain brokerage firms, they are held to what's called a suitability standard. And the reason this is very, very critical that you understand this is a suitability standard simply says that an advisor must recommend a investment product or an insurance product that is quote unquote suitable for you. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot because with today's technology and software, we advisors, we can twist and tweak and, and, and change the numbers and the inputs, and the outputs to make anything seem quote unquote suitable but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best thing for you. So it, it's there's two totally different standards. There's the suitability standard, which is a very low bar to cross. And then there's the fiduciary standard, which is the highest bar to cross. And again, very, very few advisors are true fiduciaries. Um, one differentiating factor is how is your advisor compensated, which we'll talk about in a second. But for those advisors who are selling commission products, I'm not saying that they don't do a good job. I'm not bad mouthing them at all. There are some tremendous advisors that just do insurance. There are tremendous advisors that just do investments, but they are not necessarily held to that fiduciary standard. And, and that's just one thing, the very first thing that you need to be aware of. If your advisor, as we've seen lately with people here locally, if your advisor comes to you and they say, I'm a fiduciary, have them put it in writing, have them show you their fiduciary certification. Uh, from different organizations that actually provide that. Have them put it in writing that says, I am a fiduciary to you. Now, what you'll find is most of the big firms, they will not allow their advisors to put that in writing. And the reason is because it opens them up to a whole lot of liability. If you, as an advisor, an investment broker, a sales you know, professional in the investment or insurance industry, if you put that in writing, all of a sudden you're saying to the world, I am held to this uber high standard. This standard, that is the gold standard in the industry, and I am going to put your interest first, and that makes them much more liable if something goes wrong. And, and that's why they just typically won't put it in writing. That's why the big brokerage firms don't want them to put it in writing. In fact, I've heard rumors of a few of the big firms here in Nevada being willing to leave Nevada if this fiduciary standard that Nevada has put into place in the legislature, if that is actually enforced and if it has some teeth to it, I have heard that some of the big firms may be leaving Nevada because they are so afraid of being held to a fiduciary standard. Now ask yourself this question, if they're not willing to put your interest above their own to the point that they're willing to let their businesses go in the state of Nevada, what does that say to you as an investor? What does that say to you as an investing consumer who is going to open your books and trust this investment professional, this financial advisor professional with your most intimate financial needs, goals, wants, wishes, secrets, and so forth. It says a lot to me. So number one, you absolutely must require a fiduciary standard and have it explained to you, written down on paper, signed by that investment or financial advisor professional. So they are held to that standard. 
Number two is you must understand how your financial advisor is going to get paid. And, and what I mean by this is if you think about, if you've got heart issues and you were to go to the doctor and you're going to a heart specialist because you want somebody who's, a, who's focused with laser precision on your specific needs, your ailments, and you're going to go to this heart specialist and they are an independent person they have your best interest at heart. They have a fiduciary standard and a, and, a, and a fiduciary obligation to you. And they're not quote unquote sponsored or endorsed or promoted or working for some big pharma company. You know that they're going to do what's right for you. They're going to treat you. They're going to assess you. They're going to diagnose you and they're going to do what's right for you. Now, compare and contrast that with if you're going to a heart quote unquote specialist, and that person actually, when you show up and their lab coat says XYZ pharmaceutical company on it, and they're sponsored by XYZ pharmaceutical company, do you think that they might sell you XYZ pharmaceutical drugs to treat your problem? And that doesn't mean that ABC pharmaceutical company drugs doesn't have the better process or, or product or solution or drug to solve your heart problems. It means that hey, they might get a better commission or better perks and benefits from XYZ Pharmaceutical Company. That is a severe conflict of interest that could cost you your life. And in my opinion, your finances are really no different than your life. They are so critically important to your happiness, to your enjoyment, to your health, your wealth, your prosperity, your family life, uh, your legacy. And, and so it's very important to understand how your financial advisor gets paid. There are really only two ways that a financial advisor gets paid today. There are commissions and there are fees. A commission, simply, you know, you go to the car lot, you buy a used car, the guy's gonna make a thousand bucks for selling you this Toyota truck, whatever it may be. So they're gonna get a commission to sell you a product, just like XYZ investment professional down the street uh, or insurance salesman down the street, they're gonna get a commission to sell you a product. And that's not necessarily aligned with what's best for you. Because once they get that commission, they sell you a hundred thousand dollar annuity. Uh, they're going to pocket, let's just say seven thousand dollars. You know, that's a typical commission on on some of these annuities. And then they may get a may get another five hundred or a thousand dollars a year just to answer your answer the phone when you call. That's a commission to sell a product, but they have very little, if not no, incentive moving forward to answer that phone call when you call, when you need help, when the kids graduate college, when you want to retire. They have very little incentive because they've already made that commission. They also could have put you into no load mutual funds or diversified portfolio of very low cost mutual funds or ETFs, exchange traded funds. Now, granted, they wouldn't made that. They wouldn't have made that seven thousand dollars. They could have done that for you, but they would have cost themselves their own revenue, their own income. And again, that's a suitability standard. They can they can make a case that that annuity might be quote unquote suitable. But what might be best for you is a different approach. So the commission process, some investments are, are, are purely sold with commissions, by the way. Most insurance is actually sold through commissions. There are some, uh, including uh, some, some variable universal life policies and things like that, that are not sold with commissions. Um, but most insurance products are sold with commissions. The person selling it to you is going to get a big chunk of money to sell you that product and then you may never hear from them again. You may, it, it, everybody's a little bit different. Now the fee only model, which is third on my bullet point list here, uh, but the fee only model, that is, is more along the lines of going to your accountant or your lawyer, where you're gonna say, I need my trust set up. And they're gonna say it's $2,000. Okay, there's your fee. You get the trust set up, you're done. Thank you very much. You may come in in a year for some adjustments for $500 or you go to your accountant and they say, we're going to do this tax planning for you. And, and our rate is $300 an hour. And we expect it to be three hours, $900. Done. You know what you paid. You know you either got value for that payment or you didn't. You know you would either recommend that accountant or that attorney or you wouldn't. But it's not as if you don't know what you paid them. It's not as if they said, hey, sure, I will fix your tax return for you. Don't worry. There's no cost. But maybe on the back end, they're getting 20% of your refund or something like that. Um, so, so the fee only model, it's black and white, it's upfront, it's in your face, you know what you're paying. And, and we tell clients that we wake up every day, we have to earn it. When we show up to work, 
we have to earn it with every client, whether it's rebalancing a portfolio or doing a, a retirement plan review, or whether it's picking up the phone and answering questions or just calling to say, hey, did you get that trust done? We need to get that on file. We have to earn it every day because if we don't earn it, we're, we're gonna get fired, plain and simple. Clients are going to fire us versus the commission model where, hey, you know, we sold you that $100,000 annuity. We made the $7,000. We don't have much incentive to earn it moving forward. So bye-bye, John and Jane. We're not too worried about you at this point. So the fee-only model is a much better model. Uh, and if you think about it, if you, were, if you were going to take a job and they said, yes, we're going to pay you $300,000 once, but you got to work for us for five years. Well, what's your incentive to do a really good job in year two, in year four? Your incentive is very, very little. You made that $300,000, but you don't really have much incentive to show up to work, to be on time, to give it your best. And so it's very, very similar. Whereas if, if they're paying you on an ongoing basis and you're getting your paycheck every other week, you're going to have a much greater incentive to try to work hard for that company. And your financial advisor is gonna have a much greater incentive to work hard for you because they wanna keep you as a client because that's how they make their living. Now, I wanna to touch on a very, very slick and tricky Wall Street term called fee-based. And I always say it's a Wall Street term because I think the, the marketing geniuses on Wall Street created this to lure the public into some false sense of security. For a fee-based financial advisor, you would be shocked. Most of the accounts I work with, they don't even know the difference between fee-based and fee-only. Most attorneys don't. Um, definitely, most of the investing public does not understand the difference between fee-based and fee-only. They think that they're the same thing. They hear the word fee and they think, I'm safe. I don't have to pay commissions. I'm going to pay a fee for them to do a job. And the truth is fee-based means nothing. All fee-based means is that that advisor can take fees and commissions from you. They may put on one hat that says, by the way, John and Jane, you need this life insurance policy or this variable annuity to which, oh, don't worry, there's no charge. The insurance company pays me. You don't have to worry about that. So they're gonna get a big commission for that. And then they may say, oh, by the way, John and Jane, you also need to put $250,000 into this managed account and I'm gonna manage it for you and I'm gonna charge you one and a quarter percent for that. So then they get their fees and then they get their commission and they get their cake, they eat it too. Is that truly in your best interests? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Generally speaking, I would say that it's not. So fee-based means absolutely nothing. If you take nothing else away from this, you know, this is gonna be one of the most important concepts. Fee-based means nothing. Third, we're gonna talk about your financial advisor. We're gonna talk about their credentials. Um, we'll start with that. There is one, outstanding credential in the, in the industry, and that is the Certified Financial Planner designation. It is very, very difficult to get. It's a few years of study. It's a two-day comprehensive test. You have to have a degree. You have to abide by an oath. You have to take continuing education. I believe, I'm, I believe it's 30 hours every two years, um, which is about half of what uh, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors is. They're 60 hours every two years. Uh, I believe that's the, that's the number. I know, I know mine's coming up on renewal, so I got to check into that real quick. But the Certified Financial Planner designation is by far the premier designation in the industry. And that is something that you should absolutely require. So we've actually, by the way, hit on the first three things or the first three things that if any one of my relatives on the other side of the country called and said, hey, I really want an advisor, but I want somebody down the street. I say, you need three things. You get fiduciary number one, first and foremost, in writing. Make them put it in writing. Number two, you make sure that their compensation is aligned with your goals. If, if you make more money, they make more money. If, if the market's bad and, and things aren't going well for you, they're gonna make less money. That's the fee only model, not fee based again, fee only, and certainly not commissions. And number three, you want those credentials, that education, that experience, and the certified financial planner designation is an absolute must, it's a requirement. Now there is another designation that's also equally as good in my opinion, and that's the personal financial specialist designation. Uh, in some ways it's better to be very candid because to get that designation, you actually have to be a certified public accountant. And so much of what we do on a daily basis is tied into tax rules and tax laws. And, and so I truly believe that that is a wonderful designation. I would sincerely look for either a CFP designation or a personal financial specialist designation. The third one that is a good one 
it doesn't have the two-day comprehensive test. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's because of that, it's a little bit easier to get than the first two, the CFP and the, and the PFS, is the Chartered Financial Consultant designation. And, and that's one through the American colleges, uh, the American College, and that's a good designation as well. It, it's not easy, it's, it's very rigorous, it's a lot of coursework. Uh, I just don't put it quite as high as the CFP or the PFS designation, but it is a good one. Uh, the, the following one is the CLU, the Chartered Life Underwriter one, which is also a good one, but, but to be very candid with you, not relevant to most people and most advisors. The, the Chartered Life Underwriter is also through the American College. It's, it's a lot of rigorous study and, and so forth as well. Uh, and additionally, all of these have uh, their own continuing education and so forth. But the Chartered Life Underwriter designation is more along the insurance and the estate planning side, the pension plan side, things like that. Um, things that are very important to you, definitely, but things that are also covered in the CFP does, uh, coursework and the PFS coursework and so forth. So uh, the, the Chartered Life Underwriter is good, but I would not necessarily put that as high as either of the first two uh, designations. So in terms of credentialing, what you'll find out there in the industry, in fact, I've got some of these things, um, is there is alphabet soup all over the place. So you've got, uh, for example, I've got an accredited asset management specialist. Uh, here's, here's just the brutal honest truth about my AAMS designation. It was through the College for Financial Planning. Um, I got it so long ago, I can't even remember how long it took. It wasn't that expensive. I think it took a month or two of online classes and then a proctored test or something along those lines. And it just wasn't that hard to get. It was very basic. Um, and, and that's just one example. What you'll see out there is financial advisors, they'll go for this lowest, uh, lowest hanging fruit, the easiest designation to get. And that is an example of one that's just frankly pretty easy. It's like, a, in my opinion, if you're going to entrust your assets, your, your, your net worth, your retirement to an advisor, you don't want a designation that they can get at a Cracker Jack box. And, and honestly, I have one as well. So, so there are many of those. In fact, there's probably a hundred different designations that are much simpler to get. Some of them are niche, niche focused. Um, for example, I think there's a certified divorce planning uh, designation. Um, there's a certified retirement planning designation. There's, there's all kinds of designations out there. Some of them are more niche focused. Some of them are worth more than others. But overall, you definitely need a CFP or a PFS. The other ones are great. It's just additional. It's like icing on the cake, but you need the cake first. Um, one designation that I don't have on the list here that I do believe is very credible, very worthy, and that's the accredited investment fiduciary uh, designation. And again, we're circling back to that first word, fiduciary. So that training is very, very rigorous in terms of investment management, portfolio management for a client from a fiduciary perspective. So that's a great designation. But that is not a designation that I would hang my hat on and say, I only have this. I'm, I'm a retirement planner, a financial planner, whatever you want to call me. I only have the accredited, accredited investment fiduciary designation. Well, that's great. That's helpful. But again, the overriding credentials that prove that your advisor wants to be at the top of their game is the CFP or the PFS uh, and possibly the, the CHFC as well. So moving on to education, um, all of these designations, they have their own educational requirements. Uh, I'm gonna leave it to you, the, um, the investing consumer, to draw your own conclusion, whether you require your financial planner to have a, a degree or not. Um, there are financial planners that have a degree in philosophy, and, but they got a four-year degree, so they're a CFP. There are financial planners, I've got a degree in business. Um, so some of those degrees, they really don't mean a whole lot. What really means a lot to you is those designations and that extra credentialing and requirements and continue, continuing education. Um, personally, I think it's a good thing if you have an advisor with a degree. Uh, again, if you just get the certified financial planner, you've already got that built in because you have to have a four-year degree to be a CFP. Uh, that's... Um, Gosh, I think that was probably about 10 years ago, maybe 15, that they put that into effect. Prior to that, they didn't require a degree. So it's just a little interesting trivia for you. So moving on in terms of the education and the competency. So now we're going to get a little bit more into you. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? I specialize in retirement planning, helping those who are nearly retired get retired, stay retired, make the most of their retirement, make it memorable, make it, make it purposeful. Most importantly, make it worry-free, risk-free, uh, not risk-free, but uh, stress-free. Uh, there's always risk with investing, and that's why I had to walk that back real quick. Um, but, but to make it stress-free, 
the anxiety that I see people have when they retire. We had one in the office just a couple of days ago and we've been working with him for probably five to eight years. Um, and he was just, you could see it on his face. He's worried, he's tired. He doesn't want to work anymore. He's done. He's got the assets. He can retire. How does he know this? Because he logs in and he sees his financial plan that we've created for him. Um, but we've been creating that for him and molding it and tweaking it along the way. And so he says, I'm ready. Can I do it? And the answer was, yeah, we've been going through this for years with you. It's time for you to pull the trigger. Go do it. And the weight that was lifted off his shoulders, you could see it as he walked out the door. And so that's a retirement niche. Um, there are other niches, niches that are, for example, divorce planning uh, or business succession or some focus more on taxes. Um, so there are a lot of different niches. The question is for you, what is it that is most important to you? Where are you trying to get? Are you 25 years old and trying to start a family and, and you just need some basic planning? Maybe retirement is off in the distance, but you got to put the kids through college. Um, and so there are designations for that as well. And, and so maybe you're 65 and you really need help with social security and Roth conversions, and you need that retirement specialist. Or maybe you're 58 and you're two years from retirement and you need somebody who's more of that transition type of specialty. So, so this is another thing to think about for you as an investor, as somebody who's looking for financial planning help, who or what type of specialty is, is most relevant to you. And keep in mind again, that that specialty, that advisor with that specialty, they might not be down the street, they might not be in the same city. Number one, if they're in the same city, don't be afraid to drive. I hear this all the time, people that are 30 minutes away on the other side of town, oh, you're too far, you're too far. And I said, well, you know, we're gonna meet probably three or four times in the first couple months, and then we're probably gonna meet maybe quarterly for a year, and then we're probably gonna meet a couple times a year after that. And of course, if you have questions, you're over here, come on in, let's, let's set something up. But it's, my point is, you're not driving over here every day. It's not as if you're working here. It's not as if you have that 30 minute one way trip and then one way back, 30 minutes. So don't be afraid to drive to get the advisor with the specialty, with the credentials, with the fiduciary obligation that is most relevant to you and your situation. It, it just boggles my mind how somebody won't drive across town to get the right financial advisor. They'd rather go with the broker that's right down the street. Makes absolutely no sense. And going back to the heart surgeon or, or the heart specialty, you know, if I've got heart issues, you better damn well bet that I'm willing to drive across town or even to the next state to find the specialist that's going to help me, that's going to fix me and keep me around for my kids and my wife. And, and so I'm just, this is one of those things that I still just don't understand. So don't be afraid to drive. Don't be afraid to work with somebody online. We've got clients that we've never met. And, and I'm sure at this day, in this day and age, you have already done some form of video conferencing or FaceTime. It is so easy to log onto the computer and to see your financial advisor and to go through your plan. We do it constantly. People on the other side of town, they don't want to drive over here. We'll just do a go-to meeting with them or a Zoom or whatever it is. Um, so don't be afraid to hire the right advisor, even if it's not necessarily in your locale. That's my point. The right advisor for you might be in Georgia. Maybe you just need to do the go-to meetings and maybe you see them once every two or three years. Uh, we've got clients that we do go visit once every two or three years. So keep that in mind. So credentials, education, competency, that's number three. So we've got fiduciary, we've got um, the, the compensation model, how your financial advisor gets paid. How does my financial advisor get paid? Are they commissions? Are they fee-based? Which means nothing or are they fee only? And then we've got your credentials in the specialty area. So now we're going to talk about where do you find these advisors? If you can agree with me that those first three things, fiduciary, compensation model, and credentials like the CFP designation, that those are critical to you accomplishing your goals, then the, it's real easy to find advisors. This is the easy part. You've already gotten past the hard part because now you understand what fiduciary is. You understand that suitability really doesn't mean a whole lot. And you understand what fiduciary is. You understand how your advisor should be paid and that it's aligned with your goals. You understand that they need the education and that specialty to tackle your specific problem or your specific goals. And so it's real simple to find these financial advisors. This list, NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, if you look at my website, RetireWire, just go to the search box and, and put in how to find a financial advisor, you'll see this blog post and there's links to all of these. NAPFA, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, is a spectacular resource for investors 
consumers of financial planning services to go and find the right financial advisor that's close to them. If you really want to meet with somebody in person, or even you can go in there and find a specialist too, go to NAPFA. The Garrett Planning Network is an excellent organization. Uh, they are fantastic. They are dedicated to being fee only. In fact, a lot of them don't even do assets under management. And so that's a fantastic organization as well. You can go again to retirewire.com, type how to find a financial advisor in the search bar, and you will see this blog post and there are links. CFEX is an organization that's uh, an organization, oh, excuse me, tongue twister, organization that is near and dear to my heart. Um, we are CFEX certified. CFEX is the Center for Fiduciary Excellence. Uh, to my knowledge, it is the first and biggest um, organization of its kind that issues and I guess promotes a fiduciary competency designation. It is very difficult to get CFEX certified. Um, you've got to open up your books and records as a registered investment advisor and say, here's how I do business. Here's how I invest my client assets. Go ahead and audit me. In fact, I went through an SEC audit last year and it was easy. I had very, very few issues whatsoever. And these two auditors brought their badges, showed up, sat in my conference room for a week and just peppered me with all these questions to which I had all the answers. I had all the documentation. I had all of my I's dotted, all of my T's crossed because specifically I am CFEX certified, which sets a bar very, very high for a financial advisor because you've got to have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. So CFEX, Center for Fiduciary Excellence, there are roughly, I think, 220 or so CFEX certified firms around the world. There's only two of us here in Las Vegas, Nevada. CFEX is a great, uh, a great place to go and find a financial advisor too. You will also get in that CFEX certification, you'll get CFPs, PFSs, you'll get fee-only compensation models predominantly. Um, so that's a great place to go. The fee-only network, uh, that is just a website that promotes fee-only financial advisors. Not all of them are in NAPFA, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, uh, but many of them are. So that's another good place to go. Uh, another way that a lot of people like to find a financial advisor is referrals. So they'll ask their friends, they'll ask their neighbors, they'll ask their family, hey, do you have a financial advisor? Do you like them? Now, most people are going to answer yes and yes. Do they know if they really like them? Have they watched this webinar or listened to this podcast and understood that their financial advisor, there's a 90% chance they are not even a fiduciary. That means that they are probably selling products for commissions, maybe taking fees, maybe they're credentialed, maybe they're certified financial planners because these things are all mutually exclusive. You can be a commission-based financial advisor and a CFP, but not a fiduciary. You can also be a fiduciary and a CFP and be fee only. Um, so these things are, are kind of mutually exclusive. So your neighbors, your friends, your family, they probably don't know what to look for. So be very careful when asking for referrals because the entire industry, again, going back, I think it's higher than 90%. I think it's closer to 94 last time I did my research. But if you are looking for a true fee-only fiduciary financial advisor, chances are your neighbors don't have one. If you're going to do that and ask your neighbors, just say, hey, look, I'm only looking for fee-only fiduciary. Is your advisor a fee-only fiduciary advisor? That's the best way to start. And so, you can ask your neighbors, you can ask your friends. It's not a bad way to do it because if they got somebody that they love and they are fee-only fiduciary, then now you're two steps ahead of the game. You don't even have to go to these online resources like NAPFA or Garrett Planning Network. You're just gonna go interview. So let's talk about the interview. Um, now, the interview process, you're going to reach out to these advisors, I suggest strongly. In fact, when people come into us, I'm, I'm thrilled when they tell me that they are interviewing three advisors. If they say five, I start to wonder, maybe it's just not worth my time because you're probably just kicking a lot of tires. If you're gonna interview one, I don't know that that's enough. I think that you need to interview more than one financial advisor. Um, and even if you interview two or three fee-only fiduciary advisors, you might click really well with one and you really might not click with another. And it's really important that you find that relationship, that, that you have that rapport, that you get that warm, fuzzy feeling so you can feel trust and confidence in the person that you're trusting your entire financial life to. These people are going to make recommendations that you will most likely implement or they will implement for you. You have to trust them. You have to let them do their job too. 
And, and for you to do that, you're going to need to have a rapport, a warm, fuzzy feeling with these advisors. Um, so when you do make the short list, please interview two, maybe three advisors. Uh, again, maybe pick, maybe interview four, but maybe find one online that is really focused on your specialty or your niche. Um, and so those are, those are some things that are, that are very important to you as the investor. Now let's talk a little bit about how do you interview these people. So on the NAPFA website, they have some tools. And so what I'm gonna show you now is, this actually is the Comprehensive Financial Advisor Checklist. And so NAPFA has created these things you will find the links to these within the blog post I just remember, uh, I just mentioned, retirewire.com, go to the search box, how to find a financial advisor. But if you go and fill these things out, it's a very easy conversation to have with any financial advisor, unless that financial advisor is not a fee-only fiduciary, because then they're gonna squirm. They're gonna feel awkward. Well, I do take commissions, or you know, I don't know how to answer that, um, because I'm not a CFP, or no, I won't put fiduciary in writing. So you're gonna to get to know a lot about these advisors by asking these questions. You know, Do you have a degree? Are you a CFP? Are you NAPFA registered? And NAPFA is fee only again. Uh, it's the largest organization of fee only financial advisors. How long have you been a financial advisor? Most financial advisors wash out after two or three years because it's a, generally considered a sales job. They've gotta go out and sell mutual funds, variable annuities, life insurance policies, stocks, bonds, everything in between, or they're out of work. Um, so you also want to have some sort of, uh, of tenure, length of experience. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be 24 years. It could be five years, uh, but you want to have some sort of length of experience. Um, you know, are, are you going to work with this advisor specifically? Are you going to work with another advisor? Are you going to be working with the team? Will you put fiduciary in writing? That is absolutely key. What happens to you, Mr. Advisor, if you die? If I walk out the door and get hit by a bus or struck by lightning, I've got a business partner who's gonna pick up the pieces for me. He's gonna make sure that, that you, John and Jane, are taken care of because I got struck by lightning. How are you paid? What's your hourly rate? What do you charge for a financial plan? By the way, I'm gonna digress here for a second. One of the best things that you can do is hire a financial advisor who will charge you a fee for a plan. Now, here's what I mean by that. We call it a test drive. So for example, we do a, it's kind of a, a one, it's a, it's a planning event where we will sit down with somebody and meet with them for three hours and, and go through their finances and create a plan, give them an executive summary and say, here you go, John and Jane, you go do this. Here is your plan that we discussed, that we tweaked, that we molded, modified, changed, that you feel is appropriate for you based off of everything that we've, di we've discussed. We did your risk profile. We entered your savings rates. We know you're going to do Roth instead of 401k because your tax rate is really low right now. It's going to get higher in the next five years. So those those are more like a test drive of your financial advisor. If you can find a financial advisor that will work with you hourly, that will work with you on a project basis, it is a very, very inexpensive way to get to know them and to see what they do, to see how they, they act and interact with you. Um, so just a little bit of a, of a digression there, most financial advisors will not do that. They are working for the big firms, they just sell products, and they may do a quote unquote financial plan for you. But I guarantee you, it's gonna be tied to a product, an insurance policy, an investment, uh, a variable annuity, an investment strategy. It's gonna be tied to something, and it's gonna be how do we fit this into your plan versus let's create your plan and make it work Oh, by the way, these investment, you know, this investment stuff that we do over here, that's just the, that's just gas in the car. The car is going to get you there. We just made the car. We just created your plan, but that's just gas in the car. And so it's very important if you can find somebody who will work with you on a project basis or an hourly basis, please do that. Try that. If it's $2,500, then spend the $2,500. It's a lot less than the $7,000 that you just paid in commissions to the insurance agent who sold you the variable annuity. Um, do you have a minimum fee? What are your fees? How do I get charged? What type of investments do you do? What's your strategy? What's your philosophy? Um, what type of services? Do you do estate planning? Well, no, we don't do estate planning. We have experts who do estate planning. We, we actually introduce you to experts. We don't do taxes. So you want to know these things. Some advisors do taxes. Some advisors do estate planning. Um, you want to know what are you getting into? What are their specialties? What is their education? Uh, and so forth. And so these are just some things this comprehensive financial advisor diagnostic and again the link will be retirewire.com 
and these are just some things that you really need to bring with you to this interview because it's not as if you you know are trying to pigeonhole that advisor they they should not be taken back by this if they're not getting these questions there's a problem in fact we prefer it when clients ask us these questions because honestly we can answer them in all the right ways i'd rather you ask the question because it, to me it says that you took the time to know what you're looking for i would rather you take the time to know what you're looking for to know who you want to work with and to know what specialties and credentials and fiduciary is and how compensation models work you need to know all of those things. I would far rather that you took the time and ask, if the, ask us these questions. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit about how to find a financial advisor. Actually, it's a lot of it about how to find a financial advisor. It's not always easy. They're not necessarily down the street. Some of them are across the country. Find the fee-only fiduciary that is specializing in your financial goals, your financial issues that can help you that has the experience, has the credentials, far better than finding the broker down the street just because they're five minutes from your house. Who cares if they're five minutes from your house if they're gonna sell you products, if they're gonna sell you strategies that don't make sense for you, if they're gonna sell you things that they're not acting as a fiduciary to you in. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Um, again, my name is Greg Phelps, President of Red Rock Wealth Management, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, my passion really is, is sharing with you how to accomplish your goals, especially those of you who are close to retirement. Uh, and again, that comes from after 24 years of doing this, seeing so many people with beads of sweat dripping down their face as they're deciding whether to retire or not. And, and my passion really is to, is to take that and, and make it a stress-free, a worry-free environment through the planning process. The planning process comes first, people. Through the planning process, I wanna take that stress away. And that's kind of my little niche of the world. I love to educate people. I love to do webinars like this, and I love to talk to people like you. So again, thank you very much for your time, retirewire.com. Also, please subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel. The videos that I do will typically be on the YouTube channel first, and then I create a blog out of them, and I post the videos onto retirewire.com, and then I create a podcast out of it just to make sure that I hit all of the other areas. Um, you can. Follow us on or follow me on Twitter at RetireWire, Facebook at RetireWire, uh, YouTube uh, at RetireWire. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today and have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday afternoon.